We've been talking about skeletal muscle, right? Skeletal muscle, muscle, muscle that's attached to bone and sometimes to skin. Now remember, there are two other types of muscle tissue. Cardiac muscle cells are striated like skeletal muscle cells. So they have the A bands and the I bands and the myofibrils and all of that business. But the cells are much smaller. If this is a skeletal muscle cell, this would be a cardiac muscle cell. And usually it only has one nucleus. Sometimes you'll see two, but usually only one nucleus in a cardiac muscle cell. Now, skeletal muscle cells store a lot of calcium, right? Sarcoplasmic reticulum has the terminal cisterna where all the calcium is stored. So you get the triad, you get the T-tubule and the two terminal cisterna. You still have sarcoplasmic reticulum in a cardiac muscle cell, but no terminal cisterna. A cardiac muscle cell is much more dependent on the extracellular fluid levels of calcium than skeletal muscle cells. Skeletal muscle cells store a lot of calcium on the inside. Cardiac muscle cells do not. When we get to talking about the heart a little bit later, we'll talk about exactly what the significance of that is. It's important. Just know for now that skeletal muscle cells store a lot of calcium. Cardiac muscle cells do not. They have some, but they don't have nearly as much. So they are very dependent on the levels of calcium ions outside outside the cell. Unlike skeletal muscle cells, cardiac muscle cells do not do anaerobic metabolism very well. No oxygen to the cardiac muscle cells, they die. They have lots and lots of myoglobin, lots and lots of mitochondria. They need that oxygen. That's why the heart's red. Now, cardiac muscle cells aren't attached to bone. I say that, that should be obvious, but you know, I never assume anything Cardiac muscle cells are attached to each other. And one cardiac muscle cell is attached to the next cardiac muscle cell at little places called intercalated discs. That's what these things are. They're literally riveted, protein rivets. Rivets the cell membrane of one cardiac muscle cell to the cell membrane of another cardiac muscle cell. Because what cardiac muscle cells do is pull on themselves so that they squeeze the chambers of the heart. Make sense? Now, what's also present in these intercalated discs are what are called gap junctions. The desmosomes are the protein rivets, those are that's what they're called, little desmosomes. That's the protein glue or protein rivets that attach this cell to that cell. What you also have here are gap junctions. What the heck is a gap junction? Do I know? It's a way to connect one to the other. Things can pass through. Right. A gap junction is basically a tongue for ions. And so what happens is you've got little gap junctions here. That if, let's say, for some reason, sodium ions go in here, then the sodium ions don't have to go from here out here. The sodium ions can travel from one cell to the next. See how that works? So gap junctions are essentially electrical synapses. If you take two cardiac muscle cells, two individual cells, and you put them in a, in a petri dish with some, some electrolyte solution, what happens is they will start to, they'll, they'll initially contract on their own and they'll each have their own little rhythm. But within just a few seconds, they will begin to contract together. Because they will the, the ions that are moving will synchronize the two cells, even though they're not even physically touching. And just the fact that they contract on their own is interesting. So that's another difference. Cardiac muscle cells are autorhythmic. Cardiac muscle cells do not need a neuron action potential. Skeletal muscle cells must have a neuron action potential. Cardiac muscle cells do not have to 
Now, if you remember the autonomic nervous system, the sympathetic autonomic nervous system can speed the heart up. The parasympathetic autonomic nervous system can slow the heart down. So the nervous system can influence the heart, but the heart cells, the cardiac cells, will contract without the connection of the nervous system. Everybody, you've probably heard of RSV, respiratory syncytial virus. Okay. What's a syncytial? In RSV, what happens is the respiratory epithelial tissue, and this is the respiratory epithelial tissue, it's actually it's probably pseudocolumnar, whatever. But anyways, ciliated, right? The virus infects one cell, there's the virus, and what it does is it actually fuses the cells together, and what happens, they lose their cilia, anyways. That's called a syncytial. That's what a syncytial is, respiratory syncytial virus. So what a syncytial is, is basically a few, a bunch of cells that fuse together into one giant cell. Now, what happens is because of the gap junctions, the heart itself acts like a functional syncytial. You still have individual cells, they haven't fused, but because of the gap junctions, one, when one cell contracts, all the cells that are electrically connected to that cell contract together. So that's what I mean by functional syncytial. I don't know if your book even uses that term. I like it. Mm -hmm. The RSV part, that's, that's free. <laughs> they're not really connected, you just, they're just more similar in function. They're functionally connected, but not physically. Well, they're physically connected, but they're still individual cells. Right. It's not one giant cell membrane with a bunch of nuclei. It's still cell, 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 cell. In other words, they, this doesn't happen. The memory doesn't go away. But because of the gap junctions, essentially, physiolo physiologically, it's not there. Even though anatomically it's there, physiologically, it doesn't exist. Because of the gap junctions. Now, remember we said that if you stimulated a skeletal muscle cell fast enough, we could make it go into complete tetanus? You cannot do that with your heart, which is a good thing. Because if it did, your heart would go, and then it would stop. <laughs> and all the blood flow would stop. It's not good. So we'll talk about exactly why you can't do this. Why is it that the contractions last, a, one, a twitch of a heart muscle cell lasts much longer than the twitch of a skeletal muscle cell? We'll talk about that when we get to the, that part of the next chapter. But for right now, just, just know that. That's one of the differences between cannot summate, you cannot tetanize a cardiac muscle cell. All right, so that's kind of a brief cardiac muscle tissue versus skeletal muscle tissue. We said that both cardiac muscle cell and skeletal muscle cell was striated, right? As the sarcomeres, the, the A bands and the I bands and all that business. Smooth muscle is called smooth muscle because it is not striated. It doesn't have mild fibrils. It doesn't have sarcomeres. It does have thick and thin filaments, but they are arranged differently. They're not arranged in that repeating overlapping pattern. So that's why you don't see the striations when you look at smooth muscle on the microscope. What you have is you have myosinectomy. You have the thick and thin filaments. The thin filaments, instead of being attached to Z-lines, they're actually attached to what are called dense bodies, these little things. And then those dense bodies are actually attached to what's called uh, intermediate filaments. It's almost like a, a mesh, like a, a, a net on the surface of the cell. And what happens when a, when a smooth muscle contracts, it doesn't just contract this way, like a, like a skeletal muscle cell. It actually, it actually squishes in all three dimensions. It does that. It's just like if you, if you put a, a net, like net stockings, and pull it tight, it would just squish it all together. Um, they, they can connect um, every which way. They can connect end to end, they connect, and mostly it's, they're, they're used to overlapping side to side, it's, not, it's like this. Um, you have a layer of smooth muscle, and remember, every tubular uh, structure in your body, blood vessels, respiratory tract, urinary tract, 
pull open your glutes. You'll have like smooth muscle here, smooth muscle there. still grab the active filaments, but they they don't, they're not arranged in circulars, and so that's why they're just kind of distributed all throughout, and so you don't have, when you look at them in the microscope, you don't have that pattern of A-bands on it, because they're kind of just all through here. They're not all lined up like they are in cardiac and skeletal Remember that we said skeletal muscle cells, there was one neuromuscular junction for skeletal muscle cell. That one skeletal muscle cell only had contact with one neuron, but that neuron could have contact with different skeletal muscle cells, right? Okay. So smooth muscle is a little bit different. Smooth muscle cell can have, uh, let's say this cell might have a connection from a sympathetic autonomic neuron, and in a different spot it may have a connection from a parasympathetic autonomic neuron. So a some smooth muscle cells can have more than one neuromuscular junction. Other smooth muscle cells may have no connections to neuromuscular junctions. For instance, in this particular group I've got drawn up here, this one cell may be connected by gap junctions to the rest of these cells. And so a signal from the sympathetic autonomic nervous system can generate a contraction in this one, can increase the contraction, the contraction in this one, and then the rest of it would contract with that. Parasympathetic might decrease, might make that muscle cell, um, make it harder for it to contract so it would relax, and then the rest of these would relax along with it. Does that make sense? All right, this is one smooth muscle cell. You can have one neuron And another neuron over here. You never see that in a skeletal muscle cell. You never see two neurons innervating the same skeletal muscle cell. Right? So essentially you have two neuromuscular junctions on this smooth muscle cell. Smooth muscle cells always have a certain amount of contraction present. They have a resting, it's not resting state of contraction, but <laughs> a baseline level of contraction. And that's the, one of the cool things about smooth muscle is that since it has kind of a, a baseline state of contraction, you can decrease that or increase it. Whereas skeletal muscles, all you can do is increase or stop it. Does that make sense? Smooth muscle cells can be stimulated by the nervous system. They can be stimulated by, some of these are automatic, like cardiac muscle cells, they generate their own action potentials. And other smooth muscle cells can actually be stimulated by hormones. So lots of things, they can stimulate themselves, or they can be stimulated by the nervous system or hormones. Ladies, menstrual cycle. Anybody have digestive issues, GI tract issues? During, yeah. Some people get constipated, some people get diarrhea, some people bloat. I mean, all kind of weird stuff happens. And so that's the, those, that surge of hormones during that menstrual cycle as the hormone levels go up and down, it can affect the smooth muscles of your GI tract. Now, remember we don't have sarcomeres. We don't have... Um, a bands and I bands and all that kind of stuff. So the way that skeletal muscle, excuse me, the way that smooth muscles are stimulated is a little bit different. You still have calcium ions from the extracellular fluid. The calcium ions are still involved, but you don't have the troponin and the tropomyosin like you have in skeletal and cardiac muscles. You still have myosin. You still have actin. You still get the thick and the thin filaments, but you don't have troponin and tropomyosin. When those calcium ions enter, instead of binding to troponin, which is what they would do in a skeletal muscle cell or a cardiac muscle cell, they bind to a, a molecule called calmodulin. And then calmodulin activates an enzyme called myosin light chain kinase. Basically, it's the activation of that enzyme that allows the myosin heads to reach up and grab the active. So it's a different mechanism. But the result is the same. You get cross bridge formation, and as long as the calcium is bound to the calmodulin, 
the enzyme stays active, and you get the correction cycle. Only this time, realize we're not just going end to end, we're going in all three dimensions, because that cell is getting squished. It's contracting in all three dimensions. 